And we're back, Star Trek Picard, Season 2, Episode 2. Um, <clears throat> I just did a bit of a sarcastic kind of shrug thing to, for the cold open because I was being lazy. Uh, but in actual fact, the uh, I th- <laughs> I'm being cautiously positive, and, um, but not overwhelmingly so. One thing that's happened already, regardless of what's in the content of the episodes, is that it seems to have a lot of forward momentum, which Season 1 did not. I think it's still got its problems, but stuff has happened. Whereas probably the first five episodes of Star Trek Picard season one were basically the same thing repeating itself over and over and over. Um, whereas this has moved the story forward significantly. Um, and we're now doing a Star Trek four, basically, which we knew was going to happen, but like they've been very on the nose about that. This is so intensely Easter egg heavy as well. Um, for Star Trek stuff as you probably may have seen on social media because we are doing spoilers here you know it's been a couple of days now I'm recording this on Monday for Patreon those of you publicly will be getting it getting it Wednesday um they do a whole thing of evil Picard's trophy room and all the skulls are basically characters from Deep Space Nine because people love Deep Space Nine because a lot of fans think it's the best Star Trek including me I think um so it's like oh here's a roster of Deep Space Nine villains that Picard is worse than and then not necessarily villains, you know, like Sarek's in there and stuff. Um, some kind of Grand Nagus, which one we don't know. Um, but it's probably meant to be one of the ones we know and love from DS9, uh, from the Ferengi. So, so whatever. Um, so, yeah, I think it still inherits the problems that I discussed last week in that, uh, you know, it's set in a kind of faux mirror universe, which does a lot of the same things the mirror universe does. It's all very fleshed out. I'll give it that. Um, it, it has your kind of future dystopian fascist thing down down to a T and the the crew are currently unraveling what caused this um seven of nine is evil president of earth picard is uh evil general president's kind of right hand man by the look of it uh she's married to a man because obviously she was in a relationship with raffi before and all the other characters have jobs are on the run including goofy scientist girl whose name i can't be bothered to remember um yeah so i mean that's that's all good I and mean, i do think you know, it all it all seems kind of like a, a step up generally. It seems like an improvement generally. Um I'm just finding it hard to know exactly what to say. There's more of John Delancey as Q, who is great. He's just so fucking good, right? We um we're glad to have him back. And Picard seems to insinuate that he has God cancer or something. So he's like, You're unwell. I do find it Oh, this is right, so this is a kind of take I have on modern Star Trek, which I found with Picard. I do think that they've lost sight of what the character Picard was like. I think that's been going on since Star Trek Nemesis. And I think part of that is Patrick Stewart dictating what that character's like. Um, we get so much less of the kind of thoughtful, philosophical, former archaeologist, for that's what he is. Uh, and like more of him kind of swearing and being edgy and cool dark. And... Two things that I've kind of crystallised me of modern Star Trek. Uh, I am not a censorious person. I am not a person who holds back when it comes to uh, naughty words. As you know, anybody who watches this channel probably knows one of the things holding back our growth, apart from the low pot quality of the content, is uh, our videos getting restricted because of all the potty mouth in them. And that embarrassing incident on Spanner's podcast last Christmas where I kept saying fuck. Um, and you're not allowed to swear on his show. Anyway, I find people st- swearing in Star Trek a bit weird um i'm all for the kind of dorky civilization that exists that's gone past swearing and money you know like R- riker the like one of the biggest action heroes from star trek was like into the trombone you know what i mean like it's all a bit dorky and that's good and, like making things edgy by having picard say shit every now and then and also captain rios like smoking i i people smoking like in star trek don't get me wrong i'm not saying you shouldn't smoke in fiction at all um and I've been known to smoke from time to time. It's not that. It's just it seems weird in Star Trek. You don't have to be use naughty words and have people doing cool things and having tattoos on their cocks for Star Trek to fit in. Fundamentally, I think something that's been going on since the first Bad Robot Star Trek movie, which I like, which I've said, it's increasingly Star Trek for people who don't like Star Trek. Like, okay, Star Wars isn't very sweary, but Star Wars has a kind of griminess to it. Um... And a kind of edginess to it where people are kind of treacherous or dark or kind of deceitful or criminal, but they're still friends as heroes or anti-heroes. And Star Trek isn't really that. And it really wants to be. And quite quite often now, 
a lot of the locales are like that as well. So like everywhere is a kind of grimy, you know, grimy and industrial or kind of like a a, a Hong Kongy street and stuff like that with those people moving through the shadows. That's not really what Star Trek was was like. It is now because it's made by people that don't like Star Trek, as far as I can tell. Um, I'm not sure if there are any kind of like continuity fluffs and stuff in this episode. I'm sure. I'm sure there are. Um, but that's kind of where I'm at with it. I, I think it's a lot better. I think there's forward momentum to it. I think the characters are starting to bed in as well, um, which is nice. I think that there's obviously been some behind the scenes changes after the first season, um, and you know they make it very obvious kind of who's who in the roster. The big returning thing is that uh, the Borg Queen has joined the crew. Um, so, you know, this mega fascist, mega space fascist society has subjugated everybody to the point that they've even beaten the Borg and uh, they've been teleported into this reality. It's not another universe, it's just because Q changed the timeline. They've been teleported into this reality uh, on the day that Picard was supposed to publicly execute the Borg Queen. And um, as the script just says outright, if you want to travel back in time by slingshotting around the sun, like in Star Trek IV, you need a brain like Spock to do the calculations. We don't have Spock. Oh, but we have a Borg Queen. So we're going to have the crew being slung back in time, Star Trek IV style, to do a Star Trek IV uh, with the Borg Queen doing the calculations for them. Because obviously the Borg, the Borg Queen's life's a threat as well. Uh, and this obviously has to link up in some way to the appearance of the Daft Punk Borg Queen from episode one. Uh, it's a new actor playing the Borg Queen, I'm pretty sure, um, with all the makeup and stuff. Looks cool. Looks like the Borg Queen. All good. Hasn't, hasn't got any legs. If I was doing it, though, they, I, I think she's got arms, but she's got no legs. and She's in like a containment kind of tube waiting to be executed. I'd have had her just be this part, like in uh, the gross thing from First Contact, right? Because that's quite a visceral sort of body horror-ish thing. A bit like in the remake of Robocop when Joel Kinnaman, you know, is in pieces in that one scene. I'd have done that, personally, but... Then again, I'm not making multi-million dollar Star Trek uh, content. I'm a middle-aged man living in a rented flat. So nobody's going to ask me. Um, and that's where they kind of leave it. So they're about to do a Star Trek 4. And we have to go back to 2024 to find out where the change in the timeline happened. Um, and we know that Brent Spiner is back playing yet another Soong song. Um, yet another one that they've introduced. And it's probably something to do with him and possibly even his character from... Uh, not that character, but somehow, you know, well, obviously related to, but his character from Star Trek Enterprise. Um, he was more of a kind of eugenicist, geneticist type type chap. Um, so, yeah, and, and we're off to the races with that. I don't really have a lot to say. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm, padding, I'm padding this out a little bit, but um, whilst it's... Be- Do you know what? This is the thing. Here's what's changed. Star Trek Picard, like, offended and irritated me. This is boring me a little bit, which is an upgrade. That's an improvement, all right? That's <laughs> that's a good thing by by the rubric of how this, how this will be judged. Um, something else, just again, about modern Star Trek. I, I think something that kind of makes it feel not very Star Trek-y is making the TV versions quite cinematic. And I do think... I know it's a bit of a slightly outdated style, but... Star Trek was usually kind of, for the most part, like locked off cameras. Star Trek was shot like a period drama because it was most often about discussion and debate. Not in the movies. The movies are more kind of red alert, red alert, something's going to blow up, blah, blah, blah. But, the, you know, the TV show is quite often about ethics, science uh, and, and discussion and diplomacy. So it was shot as such. And uh, modern Star Trek seems to be about doing backflips with double pistols and saying a cool quip, but having murdered a room full of people then saying we love peace and science afterwards. And I do think that that kind of stuff being gone and the new sort of camera, uh, the use of the camera, the lighting, the editing, which is all superb, by the way, I'm not sure it's best deployed here. It would be nice to see some direction where they hold off a bit more and be a bit more conservative with their camera moves and stuff. Uh, just to make it feel a bit more like Star Trek. Am I wrong about that? I don't know. I mean, I know that that's what... Um, I haven't really watched the Orville. I think I've seen it one episode, but they film it like an old 90s Star Trek, right? And they do those kind of rack-ins when the music swells when there's an ad break and stuff like that. I'm not saying go fully like that. That's a bit too much. And the Orville is doing that on purpose because it's this kind of tribute to all that. And that's great. But I think there's, I think there's a happy medium. If you shot it like The King's Speech or The Crown 
or Downton Abbey, you know, in terms of camera movement and framing, I think it would feel more like classic Star Trek without having to compromise looking like a show from the 90s or the 60s. The fascist uniforms look cool <laughs> for Evil Town. Um, but yeah, that's it. I sort of got, I'm afraid. Bit of a tepid interview. I'm very sorry. Interview, tepid review. I'm very sorry. Uh, I feel like I've I've spun my wheels in the dirt, but I just, I've been quite unmoved. I was once again looking at my phone and that's bad reviewing. I had to rewind back. I did take penance by re- when I realised I was looking at my phone, spinning back and watching the bit again because I'm duty bound to do so if I'm going to review the thing. Um... Yeah, that's it. That's it. Leave your comments below. Start a discussion in the comments if you like. Uh, like and subscribe. Follow me on TikTok. Follow me on OnlyFans. Follow me on Havo Hotel. I don't have any of those things. Uh, I'm out of here. More Star Trek next week. Goodbye. <laughs>